this is covering the spread. Here are your hosts, Jim Sawness and Dr. Ed Feng. What is going on, everybody? Welcome on into Covering the Spread. That's right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and NumberFire.com as we are taking a look once again at some men's college basketball conference tournaments and breaking down ways you bet them with Eli Hershkovich of You Better You Bet. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a senior writer and analyst for NumberFire.com. Joined here, as always, by Ed Feng of ThePowerRank.com. You can find Ed on Twitter at ThePowerRank. Ed, you were in Boston at Sloan this weekend. How did yeah. things go out there? It was great as usual. I would I would say it was a little bit more tame yeah. than usual. It wasn't because of the coronavirus or just because no. of other stuff. No, just every conference has a different feel yeah. depending on who shows up and kind of what's going on. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I guess it felt a little partially because of me because I I <laughs> kind of like left in the middle of Friday because I had to go update some basketball predictions and write a email newsletter. So like I was just away for a couple hours. Um, You know, kind of depends on who's there. I mean, I think this is my 12th straight Sloan conference and it's the first one there without Bill Connolly. Like we just kind of always meet there. Uh, Bill Connolly of ESPN. Uh, And then I don't know. I had a different feel. It wasn't necessarily worse. Really had some uh, really good conversations with people. Uh, got to know some people, and we actually had a listener of the show. Uh, oh, wow. Let's just call him. Let's just call him Bob. Uh, <laughs> he emailed me after the show last week and was like, "Hey, you know, I I, I saw that you said that you can just show up at the Sloan Conference. Uh, I was thinking about doing that." I was like, "Sure, wow. come on." And, and he showed up Thursday night, uh, where all the basketball folks meet up at fours, and then yeah. he came by on on Saturday again. So it was fun to get to know him uh, a little bit. So the power of podcasting, you know, reaching That's out right. to people. He lived close by, so it wasn't yeah. like or, or anything like that. Um, but I know a lot of people I hung out with did not have a ticket to yeah. the actual conference and didn't seem too upset about that. And then obviously there's like with all, all the concerns out there in our world today, there was the right. issue of how you greet people. So right. if I grade, if I saw one of my friends, I, I just gave him a hug. I didn't really care because that's who I am, right? But people that you don't, that either you don't know or that right. you just kind of know it was this weird like all right let me offer you my handshake okay you're yeah. not doing that let me close my fist yep okay oh all right we're not even doing that all right here's my elbow <laughs> and so it was just like this progression of meeting people all weekend that was uh a product of our of our strange times yeah and i was in orlando for a bachelor party which means i was at epcot which is not the place you want to be in the middle of like a pandemic level type thing uh because little kids don't cover their mouths to be fully honest i don't want to be around little kids ever uh when they're sick it's especially bad when there's stuff like this going on so that was less than ideal and i got very good at opening bathroom doors because when you do certain activities at epcot aka drink around the world you have to use the bathroom a lot I yeah. went to the ba- I went to the bathroom around the world, which meant I had opened a lot of doors without right. using my hands. Specifically, leaving the bathroom because, like, I don't care going in. I'm about to wash my hands anyway. Right. But like, I used my foot. I used right. like, I used like towels uh, yeah, to try to open towel. doors. I just I don't want to contaminate myself yeah. because like this thing is legit, and I I don't want right. to like well, I can I want to take some some easy steps that I can take to try to prevent the spread if I can. Yeah, absolutely. And you should do that every winter, right? Yeah, because the flu is a huge sure. killer. And I mean, I think maybe it's just good that we're, you know, yeah. finally, we, maybe we should probably be doing this every year, every right. year. And I was joking around with my wife about how I'm going to offer people elbows in a few years when this Corona thing is no longer an issue just because, hey, flu season, you know, <laughs> just to be a contrarian pain yeah. in the rear end. I remember um, uh, in high school, I think it I don't remember if it was like bird flu or what, but uh, there was something going around. And like after football games in high school, we'd have to like shake hands with the other team. They eventually did uh, sportsmanship elbows. I think that was what it was called. Right. Where instead yeah. of, you know, high fives, you do sportsmanship get- elbows. After touching people repeatedly for three hours before that, then you go to the elbow. After- exactly. Yeah. I had at least 10, maybe 20 elbows this weekend. Yep. I like yeah. it, you know? Adapting. So, Adapting to the adapting. times for sure. Yeah. Uh, any big takeaways and, from you from Sloan? Yeah. So uh, well, I met one of my better friends that I've known for probably the longest at this conference. And he's like, hey, you know, that FanDuel Sportsbook is really sharp, man. It's really hard Ooh. 
to get down good bets uh, uh, against them. And I was like, yeah, that's been my experience as well. So, John Sheeran, if you're listening, you're doing a great job. I like it. You got to get John back podcast, on. <laughs> make sure you have multiple accounts. Um, but that is, uh, yeah, I mean, that, 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 that was unsolicited feedback. Uh, favorite talk that you went to? <laughs> so, I guess my favorite would be the one that I went to. <laughs> uh, I don't. <laughs> I don't go to talks. You're there for the networking. I'm never networking. Yeah. So actually, I sat down a couple weeks ago and I made a list of like quality of things that you can possibly do from yeah uh, talking to your son to goofing around on YouTube. Yeah, and like you know, like a face to face conversation with someone you admire and respect is like one of the highest things. So like, yeah. why am I going to some panel? where no one is going to give much goods anyways. Um, I, I mean, and when I can find, like, in, not an infinity, but, like, dozens of people that I really want to have a face-to-face conversation with. Right. And um, But anyways, I did go to the gambling panel. It was, okay. it was, it was pretty good. Yeah. Uh, it was moderated pretty well. Uh, Kip Levin, yeah. the president of FanDuel, was there. And uh, I, I've actually been wondering what the handle is on po- politics. Yeah. And he said in 2016 that whatever the European, whatever, whatever the FanDuel presence in, in Patty Power was, or Betfair, it'd be one of the two. Uh, the handle was 200 million on the on outcome politics? of the election. No, on the outcome of the election. Oh, wow. That's wild. That's no like, joke. That's insane. And I'm um, not sure it's necessary. Well, I mean, I'm not sure it's necessarily accurate. So, right. Um, yeah, I mean, there's so many interesting things there. So I thought that was... Uh, yeah, Rufus yeah. Peabody was tweeting out some of the... He had a Twitter thread on that talk. So I was reading through that just to get some of the, like, the key takeaways because right. like, I couldn't be there, so I was very curious about it. And it seemed like right. productive conversation uh, <laughs> across the whole. So uh, I'm glad that Kip was able to spread spread the good word there, too. Yeah, I was sitting in that talk, and I was texting Bill. I was like, hey, I finally made it to a talk, right? And, and the conference <laughs> starts Friday, and this is like Saturday at noon, right? Yeah. And he's like, yeah, I'm not there, and I've been streaming talks all weekend, so. (laughs) (laughs) That's awesome. Well, I'm glad that you had a good time. I'm glad that you uh, embraced the elbow, the people's elbow, going around. The people's elbow. uh, That's a nice name, Jim Sonis. What's that? The people's elbow. Isn't that that. a wrestling move? I don't watch wrestling, so I'm not qualified to talk about this. Yeah, I I don't know. I like that that name. I think it's I think it's a wrestling move. We can adapt that for the coronavirus too to try to help potentially right. mitigate slash slow down slightly the spread of all of these germs. <laughs> we're gonna right. spread some good things here coming up pretty soon because we're talking with Eli Hershkovich of You Better You Bet, breaking down some men's college basketball conference tournament thoughts. We're gonna look through the biggest conference tourneys coming up this week, assuming that they do wind up being played, uh, and absolutely go with that. And try to see where Eli finds some be- value for this week. You can find Eli on You Better You Bet uh, on radio.com. He, of course, is both a host and a producer there. So make sure you check out the Eli there and follow him on Twitter at Eli Hershkovich. Now, our producer, Calvin Theobald, has told me that it's The Rock's move, also known as the corporate elbow, when The Rock turned heel. I did not know The Rock could turn heel because I feel like that smile is too infectious for him to be a heel. But apparently we have our answers. This is why we need Cal on the mic. Exactly. So he can educate me about things that I have not paid attention to in, uh, I mean, it's interesting. I just never paid attention to it. We got to get him on the pod. Once they get DFS for wrestling, I'll consider it. But until then, (laughs) we're going to have Cal be our intermediate Mary there. We're going to break down uh, the bracket next week as well. I believe that'll be up on Monday, but to make sure you get that podcast right as it is posted, make sure you are subscribed to Covering the Spread. Uh, just search for Covering the Spread. Wherever you get your podcast, you can find it there uh, and subscribe so you get each one as they're posted and also rate and review the podcast because that does help us out a ton if you like what you hear. Now, before we bring on Eli, got to go back to last week and take a look at a NASCAR bet and you know the sweat lasted 65 laps it was short but it was sweet we'll break that down and then get to eli covering the past 
All right, so last week on Covering the Spread, uh, Covering the Future, I should say, Covering the Spread of the podcast, I wanted to talk some NASCAR with Ryan Blaney at Phoenix, and he had been arguably the fastest car through the first three races this year, and he was at 12-1 to 1 at most books. He did eventually open, because he opened at FanDuel Sportsbook after we recorded. He opened at 11-1. to 1. I did like him at that number, uh, and he was okay during the Friday practice sessions. Qualified fifth, so... I thought it was a pretty good spot. And once you account for qualifying in the practice times, Blaney was third in my model entering the race, whereas he was fifth entering the weekend. So I liked him a lot where he opened. Then he got caught up in a wreck, not of his own doing. 65 laps into the race, he finished 37th. So that one didn't go so hot. But his teammate Joey Logano won the race, and his other teammate Brad Keselowski had arguably the fastest car. So... I feel really good about the process behind the bets, and I'm very curious how Blaney would have done had he had or had the wreck not happened. Uh, but I mean, we'll never know. But I still feel good about the way things played out because there is a heavy correlation between teammates. The Penske cars are super fast, so hey, I'm okay with that one. Honestly, we'll move on to next week. And Ed, I think NASCAR is unique in. It's one of the few sports where your odds of hitting a bet can go up in smoke immediately, quite literally. And sure. it's kind of nice not to have to worry about it. I'm not going to lie. It's nice not to have the anxiety for the rest. Like, it sucks to lose your bet. But it's right. nice not to have the anxiety for the rest of the race, at least. It's a weird sport in that way. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think anxiety is just part of what comes with this business. So Yeah, absolutely. I think it's, it's exciting as well. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Absolutely. Cannot avoid it. Uh, usually don't want to avoid it. Usually anxiety is a good thing there. But right. uh, on to next I week mean, for sure. I mean, I feel like that's why my Super Bowl was very enjoyable this year. Yeah. There was absolutely. kind of lack of anxiety on, on my prop bets. It was great. I, see, like mine was anxiety driven, but the anxiety turned out okay. So that made it feel sweeter. But I am I am a very, I don't know. I don't know what the right... I want my I want to have a, a low range of outcomes in my mood. And right. so things like the Super Bowl are good every now and then. I can't handle them all that often though, which is right. probably why NASCAR is a bad thing for me to bet because <laughs> <laughs> there's a very wide range. Uh, yeah. but you know what? Uh, disregard the health, let's have some fun. Uh, but Ryan Blaney, we'll see how he does this week in Atlanta instead. We're going to bring on Eli in just one second, but if you want to get in on the action, check out the FanDuel Sportsbook and place your first bet today. If you lose, FanDuel will give you a refund of up to $500 in site credit. Visit sportsbook.fanduel.com for more details. Terms and conditions apply. Must be 21 plus and physically present in New Jersey, Pennsylvania, West Virginia, or Indiana. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Let's bring on Eli Hershkovich now to break down his men's college basketball tournament, conference tournament leanings for this week. Find Eli on Twitter at Eli Hershkovich. And again, he is a host and producer at You Better You Bet. Covering the present. Let's get set for this week in men's college basketball with Eli Hershkovich. Eli, it is a huge week for you, obviously, as you're a big college basketball guy. How you doing? Are you all excited? Are you all warmed up now from the, the mid-major conference tournaments? Yeah, I'm, I'm excited, guys. I want a Utah State future to win the Mountain West nice. at around 6-1. to one. I got that before the books took that one down. So I'm excited for the Big Ten tournament, for the SEC tournament. I have a couple value plays for both along with the Big East. So I'm ready to roll, man. Let's get going. Absolutely. Let's dive right in here. And uh, before we actually take a look at, you know, some bets that you like for this week, I want to talk to you about your college basketball betting process. Because last time we had you on, we didn't have a lot of time to actually, like, talk to you about your process. So how do you decide what to bet? Do you have a model that guides you, or is it based on just paying super close attention to news throughout the year? What kind of is the main thing for you, Eli, in guiding your college basketball bets? Yeah, I'm not Ken Barkley. I'm not Lockie Lockerson on You Better You Bet, and I applaud him for having his model because it's a fantastic way to bet on college basketball, bet on college football, whatever sport you're looking to gain an edge on. But my process has a lot to do with metrics and has a lot to do with spots. And I know when people are looking to bet on the NCAA tournament, bet on uh, the conference tournament, maybe more so the conference tournament than the NCAA tournament, you can't really bet on spots situationally in March Madness because you're not going to have, unless you get a revenge spot with a coach against his former team or a team against his uh, against their former coach, et cetera, that's sort of, sort of a scenario. You're not going to get a 
a typical revenge spot like you would in conference play, a, a typical letdown spot. Because let's be honest, in March Madness in a one and done in a one and done tournament, there are no letdown spots. So throughout the conference tournament, that's the kind of strategy I'm using. Again, using the spot process, using metrics. I love Ken Palm. I live by Ken Palm. He does fantastic work and doesn't get enough credit for people like myself and others who are looking to get an edge on betting college basketball that way. So a lot of spots, a lot of metrics. And again, just trying to find that situational edge that might not be within. Because when you think about betting on the NBA, that a, a lot of NBA lines, the the spot is baked into the number, whether it's, again, a rest, uh, not a rest day, but a travel day for a team on, on, the, on the second leg of a back-to-back or on the third leg of three games and four nights. In college basketball, it doesn't necessarily work like that. Excellent. So, um, when you're when you're looking at something, uh, you said you you like to look at spots. Like, is it a kind of thing where you'll see a line, know that there's a spot, see what Ken Palm has, and if it's you know roughly equivalent to the market, then you know to play that game based on the situational analysis that you've done. Yes and no. I'm not. I'm not because a, a lot of books take the Ken Palm line and use it as their opener. Not every book, but. Some books do, or it's usually half a point off. I've seen a, I've seen a bigger difference than in past years this year, be, yeah, probably because definitely. of the par- yeah of the parity across college basketball. But I, I use I don't necessarily use his line within the context of making a bet. I look at his metrics. So I, I have a few different metrics that I look at uh, within the context of betting on a game along with spots. Uh, scoring rate for me is big. So where an opponent gives up the the majority of their point uh, points. To the, to the opposition, so whether that's inside the arc from three uh, or, again, at the free throw line. Because if you're thinking about a team that shoots well from three and uh, the opposition gives up a, a pretty high rate, pretty high three-point percentage uh, from, again, that, that's from, from that vicinity on the court, if they don't give up, a, a t- if they're, the amount of points they're giving up, if it's not a, if it's not a lot of, of, again, points in that department, even though they give up a high three-point percentage, then I might be more interested in betting on the, again, the opponent in that instance. So a lot of it has to do with scoring rate and trying to find an area where an opponent maybe can be exposed more so than the traditional numbers say. And I know that the that numbers of like three point attempt rate tend to be pretty sticky. Uh, so seeing teams that don't give up three point attempts could, uh, you know, definitely help you out there. So I think that's definitely interesting for sure and good shouting out because that's done a lot of uh, talking, a lot of work about three po- actually making the three-point shots. But where they take right. them, I think, is, is very interesting for sure too. So let's talk about these uh, conference tournaments. You got conference tournament odds up at FanDuel Sportsbook. Are you mostly betting individual games here or do you try to, bev- uh, try to bet on who will win the whole tournament? What's your preference here for these conference tourneys? Yeah, I try to find value, and this is where, obviously, I try to find value. This is where having a, a model can help because if you're trying to find the expected value within a, an individual conference tournament future, then you're more likely to, again, be able to dig that sort of stuff out within a model. But I can use, again, a model from Ken Barkley, from anybody else, and to try to find expected value within a conference tournament future. So usually when I'm betting on, uh, again, in, in this area, right before the NCAA tournament, I'm looking to get higher odds than around 10 to 1 or double-digit odds. Because if you're if you're looking in the price range around 6 to 1, you can get that sometimes in an individual game if a team gets off to a slow start and they're uh, and they're a bigger dog if you like them to make a run in the dance. Or you could do a money line rollover. So it really is dependent upon your process. If you're just betting pregame, then you're more likely or you're probably more likely to find value in conference tournament futures than if you're looking to live bet and try to find value that way as well. Uh, but one of the conference tournament futures, if we want to get started on a on an individual sure. conference, is Minnesota. And this is kind of where uh, my long shot process comes from. Because, again, I'm looking to get better value than around 10 to 1 or so. And obviously, Minnesota is high up there in, in price or, or not not steep, I guess, depending on which way you're looking at it, at around 80 to 1. And if you think about the Big Ten tournament and the way it's shaped at the bottom part of the bracket, I think that's Michigan State's to win. But Minnesota has, well, again, they're, again, 80 to 1, 65 to 1, I believe, on FanDuel for looking at exact prices. So you might say, how is a 14 and 16 team going to at least get to the semifinal or even the conference tournament title game where you have a shot to hedge? They have your Northwestern Wildcats in the first round. 
<laughs> so so let's get that out of the way first, okay? Uh, Minnesota absolutely smacked Northwestern in that first in that last Most meeting. people did. Most yeah. people did exactly. They <laughs> shot the lights out for three of that game, and uh, and that kind of comes from again three point regression for a team that is playing better basketball than the record says, better than the traditional numbers say, because or th- the traditional numbers say. You have Gabe Kalsher who could stretch the floor. Marcus Carr can even do so when he's on from three. And Daniel Daniel Oturu can do the same, uh, kind of a stretch five or even a stretch four when Minnesota decides to go big. So if Northwestern can get by, uh, if or if Minnesota can get by Northwestern, and you think about the path the rest of the way in Iowa, then in Illinois, who an, Il- an Illinois team that, while well, they, they covered against Minnesota in that in their only meeting this season in Champaign, that game was a one-point game before the rest decided to give uh, Jordy, Georgie Bishanis Vili a couple free throws instead of uh, instead of calling it a travel or whatever whatever the call was at that at that point <laughs> in the game in the final two minutes. So I think the path to getting to the uh, semifinal against Wisconsin is is in Minnesota's favor, and the value is definitely there at around sixty-five to one, where people who are just looking at the traditional record, traditional stats may not see that. Yeah, that's fascinating. Uh, so just to show kind of the the strength of of Minnesota, um, so they're twelfth uh, out of fourteen Big Ten teams in my in my numbers, uh, but they're still forty eighth in the country. So there's definitely strength in that team, and I think like especially with a league that is so good across the board, minus two teams. <laughs> Sorry, Jim. Um, <laughs> I think it's good to kind of look at that conference to to play some of these uh, longer odds. Um, can we let's let's switch to another uh, conference? Uh, Kansas and Baylor are the standouts in the Big Twelve, uh, with no one else shorter than plus seven hundred. Are you uh, any of those longer bets in that conference stand out to you? Yeah, if you think about a Texas Tech, I, I bought a future on them, and I listen. I'm willing to an NCAA tournament future, I should say, going back to uh, a few weeks ago, a month ago, and I, I'm one of those people that. You know, some people just like to, again, say the bets that they've gotten right and not really uh, analyze the mistakes they've made. I made a mistake on Texas Tech uh, going back to last month, uh, thinking, again, that this offense, which was could shoot the ball from three and was defending the, the three the opponent's three-point uh, line at a really high clip or really low clip, again, depending uh, how you look at that percentage, that they could make a run. And with a great defensive coach and Chris Beard, even that price, though, isn't that intriguing to me at eight to one, especially with the way or seven to one, depending on the depending on the book, um, depending on how you're you're gauging whether a team is going in cold into the conference tournament or hot. I just don't like the way Texas Tech is playing right now. You have West Virginia, you have Baylor, you have Kansas. I think the the the, the elite teams in this conference rise to the top. Uh, I think we're going to get a Baylor Kansas conference tournament final. So I'm looking to bet this conference tournament kind of game by game, like you guys were mentioning earlier in Oklahoma State, Iowa State, if we're looking at it from an individual matchup perspective, uh, Nixon might not even play for Iowa State in that first game. Bolton is probably going to be out. So an extremely depleted Iowa State team without Tyrese Halliburton against an Oklahoma State team that's really playing its best ball here down the stretch. They just smacked Texas on the road. And speaking of Texas, that's a team that a lot of people have been high on. They get Texas Tech in the opener. I, I just even even if again whoever comes out of that game, I know before the uh, before the game over the weekend where Oklahoma State beat Texas by 20 plus points, a lot of people are saying Texas has a shot to make a run in the Big 12 tournament. I think this is Kansas's to win, and maybe Baylor has a shot if Jared Butler and Macy Oteague seem to find their health here down the stretch because they've been dealing with some injuries as well, uh, even Battelle and. Uh, and uh, again, if you're thinking about some of the other bigs that have been out here down the stretch. So it's Kansas and there's no value for me in that price. And I think it's really important to recognize the difference between the Big Ten and the Big 12 there, where the Big Ten seems like it's pretty wide open. The Big 12, it really is those two teams in a, in a tier of their own. So it's good that you're kind of accounting for that in your betting process there as well. Let's talk about the ACC. Not quite the Big Ten, uh, but there is a group of three at the top here. Got Florida State at 2-1. to one, uh, Duke is plus 250. And then Louisville is 3-1 to one to win the ACC. Any of these numbers intrigue you on the ACC side? Any long shots you're looking at here? Yeah, it's it's kind of the same uh, as the Big 12. I, I maybe see a little bit of value in Louisville because, again, the bottom part of the bracket. Virginia, by the way, if you think about the way they've been playing down the stretch, their last seven games, they've won them by a combined 26 points. 
That is the the lowest margin, scoring margin, over a seven-game winning streak in college basketball history. So I know this is the way that Tony Bennett teams want to play. They want to slow you down. They want to play the pack line and win with defense. So Virginia, in a sense, is is built to win these close games, and they are. We saw it last year in the NCAA tournament with the Auburn game and the Texas Tech game coming back, and even the Oregon game in the Sweet 16, the Purdue game as well in overtime. I just don't like the makeup of this team. Again, relying on those sort of scoring margins, assuming it's within a, a possession or two in the conference tournament. So I think Louisville gets to the conference tournament title game. I, I like their path to get there. Maybe there are some upsets uh, in the bottom part of the bracket with the Notre Dame, which is kind of intriguing. They've given Virginia some issues in the, over the past couple of years. But Louisville has a shot, uh, the best chance to me, uh, that in the part of that lower bracket to get to the conference tournament title game. Duke and Florida State, uh, Lockie Lockerson, Ken Barkley brought up that Duke has a little bit of value. He makes Duke to win the ACC tournament around plus 140. I think they're priced around plus 250, like you mentioned. So I just don't I, – I can't make the case for Duke with the kind of inconsistencies that they've had down the stretch. Trey Jones winning ACC Player of the Year. I, I like his game. He's improved his scoring efficiency and his offensive efficiency this season. I, I can't rely on a team, though, that has, get, again, shown so many flaws here down the stretch. And you think about – a Coach K team that has shown similar tendencies here probably since the Bagley and Carter year where they had to switch to a zone. Duke is still bottom 10 in college basketball. See, when I talk about scoring rate, this is a prime example. They've given up a bottom 10 uh, opponent's two-point scoring rate across Division One. So this team essentially gives up a lot of points inside the arc consistently. And this is not a kind of team that, that Coach K is going to switch to a zone with which that season was, again, to protect the paint and to protect inside the arc. And they showed similar flaws last year. And that's a Florida State team. If you get matched up in the semifinal against the Seminoles, they are extremely physical and will score inside, especially in transition, if they control the glass. So I'm not seeing the value in Duke. Uh, and Florida State, again, that's the kind of team that I expect to come out of this conference tournament. They won the ACC, and they have so much depth under Lennon Hamilton, one of the better guards, one of the more underrated guards in college basketball in Trent Forrest. I don't see any value in this conference tournament either. So, Eli, uh, any other numbers that you like? You had, you had kind of mentioned maybe the SEC tournament yeah. uh, before we got on the air. Yeah, SEC tournament, and then we'll get to the Big East after after the SEC, I guess. I like Mississippi State at around 10 to 1, 14 to 1. I've seen in other books too, and it's important to shop around, of course. So if you think about the bottom part of that bracket, I know a lot of people have made the case for Arkansas, and they're around 65 to 1 still on FanDuel, which is a, a pretty incredible price considering they're priced around 25, 30 to 1 at other books. Uh, Mason Jones is back. So, or not Mason Jones is back, Isaiah Joe is back. So you combine. Jones and and Isaiah Joe, two of the better three-point shooters in that conference. If they play good perimeter defense, Arkansas can make a run. Auburn is extremely fraudulent. South Carolina, I don't know what to make of them, even though they, they beat uh, Mississippi State last week on their home floor. But uh, again, I'm looking at the Bulldogs here, who have a double buy in this conference tournament. You can get them at double-digit odds. They're a big wild card, just as a team overall. I mentioned that South Carolina loss. They turn the ball over a little bit too much at times for my liking, but you have one of the more dominant uh, bigs in that conference in Reggie Perry. You have a good guard, too, in the backcourt in, in Nick Weatherspoon and a couple other good scorers in Carter, too, uh, in that area. So I, I think Mississippi State, if again, if Ben Holland, who has tournament experience going back to his UCLA days, if they can get past Kentucky, which I think they actually match, match up the best against Kentucky among any of these teams because of the size up front, and I think in that this kind of a rematch with Reggie Perry against Montgomery or Nick Richards, they slowed him down in that first matchup. I don't think it happens twice in a season. Uh, again, his physicality down low is really tough to match up against, especially if you get him established early on in the game. So I think Mississippi State presents some value, uh, again, looking at double-digit odds. Uh, lower on the double-digit scale, but still value there in the SEC tournament. All right, what about uh, the Big East? You mentioned you liked one out there. What stands out to you for that one? Yeah, this is this. I was looking at Providence going back to uh, to yesterday, even before I saw the news of Marcus Zagorowski, who's doubtful to play in the tournament with uh, with a knee injury. And Creighton has a ton of three point shooting beyond Zagorowski with Tyshawn Alexander 
and, uh, among others, and one of the better three-point shooting teams, and they also have one of the better three-point scoring rates. So they rely on uh, threes to obviously score a lot in these games within the context of that stat. If you get Providence or Butler, though, in that, again, in that semifinal, because if you're looking at the bottom part of the bracket, you have likely a Villanova-Seton Hall semifinal. I, I like Seton Hall. I have I have an NCAA tournament future on Hall at around 40-1. to 1. I got really good value back in January. I think Seton Hall, though, might be best suited. Not that they are going to try to lose, but if they do lose in, in the semifinal, even before that, let's say Xavier makes a run of the Big East tournament, then you're probably looking at Seton Hall being better off of the NCAA tournament because of the knee tendonitis for Quincy McKnight and Miles Powell. So not that I'm looking to gauge my my Big East tournament futures on the health of these guys and the the uh, again the, the trying to find uh, the best suited scenario for Seton Hall come the Big Dance. But I, I honestly think Seton Hall might look to play a little bit of just a little bit of load management with those guys because what's more important the NCAA tournament or the Big East tournament, even though obviously those guys want to win the conference tournament. Uh, but Providence or Butler could pose a lot of problems going back to that Creighton, the top part of the region, or the top half of the conference tournament. And to me, Providence is, uh, again, the physicality that they bring, kind of similar to what I was talking about with Mississippi State. But this is one of the best teams in the Big East defensively uh, among adjusted defensive efficiencies on Kempom. And they are, it's because of their physicality, again, down low, with Nate Watson and even Alpha Diallo on the perimeter, too, with Lawan Pipkins, who's more of an offensive player, but he's really improved his defensive tendencies watching him in Big East play. A.J. Reeves and, and Duke as well. I, I, I like this defense all around. And again, I mentioned the front court with Watson and Khalif Young. So if you match up again with Creighton, who they walloped at home, they blew the lead late in that game, going back to their um, uh, matchup earlier on in conference play in Omaha. This team matches up the best uh, among any team in the Big East to me with Creighton on a neutral floor because of that physicality, because they guard the perimeter really well. And that really showed in that second matchup in Big East play. So I'm looking at Providence to beat Creighton and at least get to the conference title game. That's where you're looking to hedge maybe a little bit. Or if I like the matchup even more, I won't hedge. And I think they have the best shot here, even at around six to a seven to one to win the conference tournament. All right, so we got Mississippi State plus 950, Providence plus 600. That is Eli Hershkovich. Find him on You Better You Bet on radio.com. Also, make sure you find Eli on Twitter at Eli Hershkovich. Eli, we appreciate the time. Uh, a lot of info in there. I appreciate that for sure. That's awesome. Good luck to you with all your bets this week, and uh, good luck to you in the NCAA tournament as well. Thanks, man. Appreciate the time, guys. Absolutely. Thanks for coming on. Covering the future. All right, one final thank you to Eli Hershkovich for swinging by and breaking down those men's college basketball tournament breakdowns. Talking about his favorite bets of this week. Follow Eli on Twitter, at Eli Hershkovich, and uh, make sure you check out You Better You Bet because we've borrowed a lot of their talents over the past couple of months, and uh, they've had us on as well, so really appreciate them over at that show. Ed and I always preach searching for the best value in betting on games. Look no further than the odds comparison our engineers have developed over at numberfire.com called Odds Fire. Oddsfire is the premier odds comparison experience across major bookmakers in the regulated U.S. market. Compare odds, quickly identify the best value, and even examine first-party FanDuel data all in one place. Never settle, always get the best odds. Check out the experience for free now on Numberfire or at oddsfire.com. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER and Oddsfire is especially good. Uh, Ed was talking about how people think FanDuel Sportsbook is sharp. Find a better line and do it via Oddsfire there. <laughs> And let's move now to covering the future. And you want to talk a little college basketball as well. Uh, what do you have cooking over there? Wait, first of all, is Cap going to fire me for <laughs> telling no. people how good the No, 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 no. Cap is, uh, Adam Kaplan is also involved with Odds Fire. So it's really a win-win. Uh, okay. We're good. Uh, win. And you also advocated signing up for a lot of – that's just good practice. So, hey, yep. you know, I practice. think you're good. I'll all talk right. to Cap. We're all, all right. set. No Make concerns sure here. <laughs> Um, yeah, I want to talk about college basketball. And actually, I want to talk about a college basketball game. Uh, it's been difficult to talk about games just with the quick nature of the cycle and, and nightly and whatever the lines are up. Uh, but I think there's an interesting chance to fade a team uh, later this week in the Big Ten tournament. But before we actually get to that game, uh, th that team's Wisconsin. But before we get to that game, uh, Michigan's going to play Rutgers in, uh, in the round before that. 
Uh, Wisconsin's the one seed in the tournament. And first, let me talk a little bit about Michigan basketball because I live here in Ann Arbor. I follow this team pretty closely. And I think there's a lot for Michigan fans to be hopeful for. I think if you look at the the entirety of the season, we kind of expected Michigan to be a tournament team this year, uh, bringing back your two best defensive players from last year. They've been better than just a tournament team. Uh, they're kind of slated as a six seed. Obviously, the, the season's been up and down, wildly successful in the beginning of the season, hit a bad patch at the start of Big Ten play, hit a good patch uh, sometime in February, and now have lost three or four uh, games to end the season. That's just how good the Big Ten is this year. Uh, you've seen the best teams, you know, have a rough go at it. I mean, there are 12 of 14 teams are in the top 50 when I look at my college basketball rankings. And those are those are my number numbers. So it's just tough. But anyways, I think Michigan, uh, I think things are looking very bright going forward for this team. Uh, and it goes beyond just what uh, Howard's doing on the recruiting show. So anyways, let's get on to this game. You know, if Michigan beats uh, – uh, Rutgers to go play Wisconsin, and that game would be Friday. You know, I would actually have an eight or nine seeded Michigan as the favorite over Wisconsin. Uh, my numbers have them about two points better than Wisconsin right now. And I know that seems really weird because Wisconsin just rattled off eight games in a row to be co champions of the regular season in the Big Ten, which is kind of unquestionably the best conference in college basketball this year. But you got to dig a little bit deeper into that. Uh, Wisconsin has just gotten blazing hot from three. Over that eight-game stretch, they're hitting 41% of their three-point shots. And Ken Palmer has done a lot of work showing just how strong the regression to the mean is in three-point shooting. So you do these studies by looking at you know how well the three-point shooting percentage of a team in the first half of the conference season compare, uh, compares to the three-point shooting percentage for the rest of the season. And you see big time regression to the mean. And usually that means something's not a skill. Like that's kind of the argument. But clearly shooting is a skill, right? But so, I mean, it's certainly not saying that, that, that shooting is not a skill. But I think the proper statement is randomness plays a huge role in a team's three-point percentage. And what we can say is like we expect this to regress for uh, the Wisconsin Badgers um, you know, they, they've obviously it's also interesting because they're slated to be a higher seed than Michigan in the tournament. They're on the five line in a lot of places right now. I don't think they're as good a team as Michigan. Um, I think this is going to regress. I think the markets will be close to a pick, if not favor Wisconsin by one. I think there is a little bit, uh, you know, there's obviously some factoring of, of recent games a little bit more and they've clearly been playing well. But when you can pinpoint a lot of that strictly on getting hot from three. And Michigan is usually very good at not allowing other teams to take the three. Clearly, that didn't happen when Wisconsin came to Ann Arbor the last time. But over the course of the season, they've been fantastic. So we don't have a line for this yet. My numbers like Michigan by about two, a little bit less, 1.8. Um, also, just in case Rutgers wins, because obviously that might not be the matchup, uh, I would only make Rutgers about a half-point dog against Wisconsin. So I'm giving, I'm giving kind of a take to fade Wisconsin on a game we don't even have a line on yet. That, that's like where we're <laughs> Well, see, last week I said to bet a NASCAR driver, and there weren't odds on FanDuel Sports for him yet either. So I like this. This is good. Uh, but I also think that it, it it's good to hear the process behind it because you can take the thought process of fade teams that have gotten really hot recently behind the three-point arc yep. and apply that more broadly than to just one game. So yep. even if Rutgers does win, the overall thought process of identifying teams in the same archetype as Wisconsin's at right now and betting against them is profitable. So even if like this game doesn't happen, I think the overall point is still super valuable as like finding things that are more likely to regress than others. Jim, you're making me sad about talking this game not happening, right? Because, right. You know, the Ivy League did cancel their yeah. basketball tournament this week. Yeah. So, we'll obviously, see. we're all keeping a, a big-time eye on what's going on uh, with these things. I, I know I certainly am, um, but I, I know what you meant. Like, a game, yeah. a matchup not actually happening. The right. game will hopefully happen. I think I think people are going out there right now. So, um, uh, How about a Northwestern at 200-1 to 1 for the Big Ten? Are we, uh, are we going in on this one or no? <laughs> If you Penn State, I'm out, well, Jim. Uh, I'm out, Jim. I don't like. They would don't need like... more wins in the Big Ten tournament than they had in Big Ten regular season conference play. I'm, they're due for positive regression, Ed. I'm just, that's how regression works, right? 
That's how it works. Hey, anyone can get hot, right? I mean, they've probably shot like 20% from three. They've got to get better, right? This is good. See, this yeah. is, this is, I can play the idiot when it comes to Northwestern basketball because <laughs> it makes me less sad. So I'm okay taking that role. But I also think like there's a lot of value in betting on chaos in the Big Ten tournament just because things seem to be yeah. pretty even and there are a lot of good teams yeah. there. So a couple different threads from the Wisconsin discussion point I think are more broadly applicable. And I think that's always a good thing. So, uh, Betting against Wisconsin going forward here, I think, is a good idea based on the way Ed mentioned it. Now, for me, the Players' Championship is this weekend for golf, and there's a whole lot of money on the line for the golfers, and it's often considered the fifth major, so let's put some money on the line for ourselves as well. Now, TPC Sawgrass is the host this weekend, and it's not the longest course, and that can influence who is in contention. Webb Simpson won in 2018. He's definitely not the longest guy on the tour. Jim Furyk finished second last year. He's, I think, a year away from uh, the senior level of the PGA Tour. He's definitely not bombing it. So that can increase the pool of guys who are able to contend. But the guy I want to focus on is someone who does have a decent amount of distance, but also has the control to not completely spray it. And that guy is Patrick Cantlay. He is 27-1 to at FanDuel Sportsbook, and Cantlay... Does really well in a couple of key stats. Specifically, he ranks 15th in distance in the past 50 rounds, according to Fantasy National. So he's long and can make up uh, some ground on on the longer holes. He's 82nd in accuracy in that time. That's not great. But it is better than some of the guys at the top, like Justin Thomas, Dustin Johnson, Brooks Kepka, Adam Scott. So even though Cantlay is not accurate per se, he does enough elsewhere to make up for it. And we can kind of account for that by looking at a thing like good drive rate, Cantlay is around 40th there over the past 50 rounds. That kind of shows you he's able to make up for it. Even if he's not on the fairway, he's still okay. And a big part of that is that Cantlay is really good with his second and third shots. He ranks fifth in the field and approach the past 50 rounds. He is also 15th around the green. So makes up for it if he's not entirely accurate. He can do well elsewhere. And although Bermuda, which is the putting surface for this week, is not Cantlay's best surface. He is a slightly above average putter there. And I think that what that does, it makes him a well-rounded golfer, and that's encouraging. And it's helped him perform really well recently. If we look at him since last year's Players' Championship, Cantlay has seven top tens in 19 events, and that includes a win at the Memorial, two runner-up finishes, and two third-place finishes. If we look at him in three tour events since January 1st, Cantley has actually gained at least five and a half strokes on approach twice in that time. And that's really encouraging. Now, Cantley has not played in a, almost a month now because he, he did a surgery, but that was on his nose. It's not something related to his swing. I don't think that's going to affect him all that much. And I'm willing to go at him here at 27 to 1. I think it's very reasonable to project Cantley to clean up in the ball striking stats. So. If he can just convert on that short game and not totally spray it, which it seems like, you know, he can based on uh, his profile, he should be in contention. And at 27 to 1, I will take that. Now, if you are wary of betting against Rory McIlroy, which is kind of what this is doing, I don't blame you. You could take him at plus 550 for a top 5 finish or at plus 290 for a top 10. He is plus 130 to get a top 20 finish as well. So a couple of different ways you could play this, but overall... I want to buy into Patrick Cantlay this weekend at the players. Got some distance, uh, which is not a prerequisite to win here, but it certainly does not hurt. He is not super erratic off the tee, and he's really good in the other stats uh, with his approach and his around the green play. So a well-rounded golfer, 27 to 1 to win. I like that. Uh, I like that combination quite a bit for Patrick Cantlay. Now, Ed, this weekend we have Selection Sunday, and right. obviously you're working a lot. Are you able to put on any golf? while you are working on your tournament stuff no (laughs) you gotta watch the conference tourneys yeah i mean i definitely try to watch some games um and uh i don't know i mean i think once selection sunday comes out it's like zip 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 um gotta get some stuff up on the side gotta get some predictions up uh gotta get uh i've been doing a bracket wisdom series on on my podcast feed and so there's an episode of analyzing that i would like to get done sunday so um, yeah, not, not a lot of time for golf this weekend. Not a lot of time for anything, honestly. <laughs> no kidding. I have, I was supposed to have a flight on Sunday, uh, coming back from LA 
that has been canceled because the event was canceled and right. i was all, i was preemptively like anxious about trying to get you the rundown for monday in time because like i want to give you some leeway to like study right. up right. on all that stuff I don't have to worry about right. that anymore. So, like, sure, it'd be cool to go to L.A. in March when I live in Syracuse, New York. A little bit better. A little bit better in L.A. But the fact that it allows me to just, like, focus on getting the stuff out earlier makes me right. feel, like, so much better. So I uh, I 100% cool. understand where you're coming from there. And uh, it's it's a lot. It's, it's definitely a quick turnaround. And there is a lot of work that will be jammed yeah. in this weekend through Monday. Yep. But we will talk to all of you then to get you set for March Madness. Looking forward to that for sure. And it should be a lot of fun. Once again, make sure you subscribe to Covering the Spread to get the podcast right when we post it uh, on Monday. And we'll also, I believe, potentially be streaming that one live on YouTube. That has not been confirmed yet. Depends on a couple of uh, machinations that need to happen. So I'll tweet it out. Uh, if it's going to be live on the FanDuel YouTube page, I will let you know my Twitter account, at Jim Sonis. So make sure you are tuned in there. Ed, you said that you are going to be doing the uh, podcast series once again over at the Football yep. Analytics Show. Has that yep. started already? It has. It started right. on Monday. It is Tuesday. It started yesterday. Uh, pretty pleased with how things have been going. Uh, the first episode looks at this idea of quote-unquote parody. In, in college basketball this year uh, and perspective from how you should be picking your champion. And then uh, talked a little bit about the one thing you got to get right in order to win your pool, whether you have the best analytics or not. And uh, yeah, we'll be going every, uh, every weekday until the start of the tournament. And the thing that I like about these is I don't know if this is a weird thing to admit, but I, I listen to podcasts in the shower. I don't know if that's like super strange. It might be super strange, but whatever <laughs> we're talking about it anyway. I listen to podcasts in the shower. I can listen to those episodes in like a shower in time getting ready. And yeah. so I like how quick they are and how easily digestible they are. And that's actually like, it's really nice for me to have something that's, that's so quick. I love that. Awesome. Well, I appreciate your listening. Uh, definitely. If you want more about how to get ready for your, how to win your pool and previews of teams that could win. Uh, yeah, definitely check it out. It's the bracket wisdom series on the football analytics show. All right, so just search for the Football Analytics Show wherever you get your podcasts and find that. And find all of Ed's work over at thepowerrank.com and get his March Madness book as well, thepowerrank.net. Find Ed on Twitter at The Power Rank. I am, as mentioned, at Jim Sanas, J-I-M-S-A-N-N-E-S. -N -N -E I will tweet out whether it'll be on YouTube for those of you who like to watch things live on YouTube. I think it would be uh, sometime Monday, but I'll tweet out definitive plans there. Uh, otherwise, it will be on the Covering the Spread podcast feed sometime Monday. So make sure you are subscribed and rate and review the podcast if you like what you hear. Big thank you to Eli Hershkovich for swinging by and breaking down some men's college basketball conference tournament bets. Follow Eli on Twitter at Eli Hershkovich and make sure you check out You Better You Bet as well. Big thank you to Calvin Theobald, our video producer, for keeping us on the air here today as always. Thank you, Cal, and thank you to everyone for tuning in. In. Good luck with your bets on these men's college basketball conference tournament, potentially for the players as well. And we'll talk to you once again next week to get you set for March Madness. This has been covering the spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network. <laughs>